You know, I'm listening to these powerful readings today. It seems on the surface that the Bible is telling us that it's better to be poor than to be rich. If you're rich, you're in for it. You're going to get it at the end. But that's not really what the readings are telling us. The key phrase in the reading from Amos is the complacent rich. And while he's certainly depicting wealthy people in a very negative way, giving you all these details about how they lie on these ivory couches and enjoy meat and fresh meat every day, in contrast to the poor who would rarely ever eat meat because they depended on the flocks for their survival. They would rarely ever kill one of their, one of their own animals. But the rich didn't care about that. In their hurry to drink all the wine they could get, they slurped the wine from bowls rather than sipping it from goblets. Not a very attractive picture, to be sure. But the key word, I think, in that reading from Amos is the one that's kind of easy to miss. They are not made ill by the collapse of Joseph. Now, what does that mean? In other words, these complacent rich folks live in their dissolute fashion regardless of what was happening with the poor that were all around them. They didn't care. They didn't care that the poor were struggling just to survive. In those times, more than now, there was a sacred covenant that all the people knew about and had known about since the time of Abraham. And that was that the, wells, the ones who were well off would take care of the others, like the widows and the orphans. For if no one helped the widows, they had no hope. If they didn't have a father or a brother or a son to support them after their husband died, they were on their own. And mostly they wouldn't make it. But the complacent rich didn't care about their obligation to them. So shame on them who turned their back on the ones who really needed them. Amos warns them that their fortunes are about to be reversed and they're going to spend an eternity having the kind of suffering that the poor had while they were alive. In the gospel passage, it's part of a longer talk that Jesus is having with the Pharisees. Luke had just pointed out in the sentence just before this passage starts that the Pharisees were in love with money. And you heard last week in the gospel Jesus says, you can't serve God and money. You have to make a choice. And so to illustrate that point, he tells this story about Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man who has no name, as opposed to poor Lazarus who is named. Lazarus who can't even rise from his mat because he's so covered with sores and so much in pain. Now, I did a little research on this, and Lazarus did not have leprosy, which was so common in those days, because if he had leprosy, he would not even have been allowed within the gates of the city. My medical intuition tells me that he probably had been paralyzed, either completely or partially, and utterly could not move from that mat he was on. 
And so, you know, when you lie in one place and you can't move, you get pressure sores on your body where the bone is pressing against the skin. And these pressure sores are painful. And it surely did not help that the dogs came and licked them. Initially, you think, oh, that, the dogs are being really nice to Lazarus. But their attention would have only caused these sores to become infected. So now he's got pain and he's got infection and he must have stunk to high heaven. But the rich man would come out of his house probably holding his nose and walk on by. I wonder how he justified his actions. Maybe he thought well, I can't be expected to care, take care of all these people, can I? And if I help this, this one here, then I don't have to take care of all of them. That's not my job, is it? And so his solution was take care of none of them. But as we hear in the Gospels over and over, and today is another example of it, in the kingdom of God, things are turned upside down and topsy-turvy. In God's wisdom, the ones who are downtrodden and marginalized and suffering will be at the head of the table in the kingdom of God. As Mary says in the Magnificat, the hungry he is filled with good things, the rich he is sent away empty. He has thrown down the rulers from their thrones, but lifted up the lowly. And as Jesus' story goes on, it's very clear who is going to be exalted at the end and who is going to be humbled. So I think the message is really clear. I think the Pharisees got it. It should be clear to us as well. Yes, it's good to notice what's going on around us. Yes, it's good to be aware, but that's not enough. We have to care. We have to do something. We have a responsibility toward them, maybe not in the same way that the, the Jews back in that first century understood their societal obligations, but we have a responsibility to them. We're all made by the same God. We're all part of the suffering, mystical body of Christ. We're part of them, and they're part of us. So let's pray that each one of us will come to recognize even more the kinship that we have with those who are suffering and marginalized and poor, because they're all around us. They're here in Columbia. We see them all over. So let's continue to do what we can as individuals and as a parish to take care of the widows and orphans in our midst.